Welcome back everyone to TNO, the last news of Europe. As you probably know by now, I'm called Mr. Mocha Lover, but we have our man in Riyadh. But if you'd like to read about that, I'm not going to read this. Please go right ahead. This happens every campaign just because I did finish off the focus with uh, the reach out to Riyadh. So if you'd like to read about this, please go right ahead. It happens every campaign if you play as the United States all the way through. But how long can they conjure money from the desert? Now, if you look over here, we're doing the right to liberty already. How in the world did we get enough votes? And actually, it was actually really cool, because I didn't know this until, like, after my little tirade from the end of the last episode. So, I've given things a little bit more thoughts. We've got some comments to go through as well. So, the way to do this, like, after you basically lose all your support as a, you know, as a Republican president here, um, is this little mechanic, I guess we'll say. So, we're under the political landscape, and the RDs are on the verge of disaster, even though I've increased their unity once, is that you can acquire votes in the Senate. Now, I didn't know if this only worked once, because it says, working on the upcoming bill, we need more votes, and the Republicans' votes are not enough. Luckily, we know a few Democrats and Senate Senate MPP senators that might support a cause, so we'll call in a small favor from a far-right senator and two of his friends. So, if you do this enough times, you can hopefully get three more, you know, senators support your thing, but if you look over the congressional situation, we have 42 votes, which is not enough to pass laws, because the Democrats don't like us anymore, right? So the Democrats aren't voting with us. But we've also secured eight votes outside our voting block for our next piece of legislation. So still getting a great society, even though we did use cons commands last time to get to the point where we're at. Even if we did, didn't did do that, there still would be a chance for us to get this completed. But there's a much greater chance that we keep it going as of now. So we're still finishing up the right to liberty like we did in the last video. <clears throat> now, a couple of comments include, I should not have alienated the Democrats or divided the party. Um, it is what it is. I, I, also, I'm not getting involved in Iran. I don't really care about Iran for this uh, this campaign. So, But, yeah, I mean, that's one way to do it. Another person said that it's better to ve veto civil rights as President Nixon. So you have a better chance of getting more far... Not far right, but center senator support. Um, than, than what we did with passing basic civil rights. So, And you know what? We can still do the right to life. No, I think I read this last time too. So if you like to read about this, please go right ahead. So now this might be a glitch. It might like the whole thing with getting uh, acquiring votes in the Senate. I thought that that only happens once. So like you have to do it like several times and then pass the bill and then all your extra support will be gone and then do it some more times. But apparently not. So we're still chugging along for this great society. No matter how many bad words I want to say in my head at the end of the last episode. So I so I do apologize for the end of. Last episode of my little tirade about not being able to secure rights and stuff. And as you guys did mention, quite a few of you guys, and you were like yelling at me with, you know, caps locks and stuff. Don't suppress the center NPP. You know, that's not a good idea. I know, I, I kept doing that. I just like, I don't know. We're Republicans here for this campaign, and it's just... If I see NPP, I'm, I'm thinking far right. I'm not thinking center. And I don't think we've got that many events anyways for the center anyways. I mean... Sure, we had a few, like, saying that we're working with them more, but we didn't get that many, like, super events, or just, like, talking about, hey, the center is growing maybe a little bit, maybe we got one, but I don't know. When you say NPP, I'm either thinking far, pretty much far, because that's pretty much all America's got. Sometimes the center, but we don't have, you know, RFK here, but whatever. So we got the right to life, right to life done as well, so in the pursuit of happiness. Give me your tired, give me your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore send them... Send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Emma, Lazarus, the new Colossus. With the guarantee of a good standard of living and protection from the rigors of the world, the people of America are now freed from the pursuit of mere survival and may instead work on giving their lives true meaning. This great society stands not just as a bedrock for America, but as a torch of hope to huddle the masses of our dark and frightful world. As long as we prove through the night that our flag is still waving, set a poignant example to all the oppressed peoples of the world that a better world is possible. During the dream of the new dawn. You know what? Even if we didn't cheat, and we started with, or we went ahead with, what, the 30 senators that we actually had for the Republicans before I had to use cons commands, we still might have been able to get it done. Since it's only October 11th, so I'd have to test that out. I'd have to try that out sometime then. Uh, can you do it with the way we actually did go? The Yaki's are gaining. You thought the last poll was bad, Mr. President. Look at this one. I know. Double-digit support for the Yaki's. The last few Democrats in the party are basically calling for your head to impeach you with the full support of the NPP far right. The remainder of the Republicans in the center NPP are trying their best to push through the last major proposals of the Great Society. But even they aren't sure if they can push through any more in the face of this opposition. Can I be honest? This is terrible. The party's stability is dumb. The RDs are virtually dead. And honest to God, uh, 
fascist as looking credible to a worrying large number of voters. The MPPL is pouncing at every opportunity to make us look like we are weak and not doing enough. Even our allies in Congress are exhausted and demoralized and are ready to just give up, call it mission accomplished, and go home. And I can't blame them. We have to wake up to reality here. We're destroying American politics just to push your uh, vainglorious pet project through soon. There'll be nothing recognizable of either party left, and it will be a free-for-all in the next election. Hand me that bottle. I need another shot. America's really tired of our agenda. We ain't done yet. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Civilian spending is so much. So much civilian spending. And we're on the verge of disaster. We haven't broken yet. We're not broken yet. And we still got some things to do here. Uh, we, I guess technically we could send... Oh, never mind. Um, well, they must be allied with Goring, yep. Pavali allied with Goring, that's fine, whatever. Is it, or was it Spidal? Spidal? Spadal? Spidal? Spoodal? Yep, a Shona, a Shona, okay. Control markets, very good. And, we have achieved a great society, so we could probably do this off-screen as well, but let me... I'll test that out some other time. It is done. Against all odds, all critics, and most expectations, President Johnson has realized his dream of a great American society. Though he might not have gotten absolutely everything he wanted, that he has managed to accomplish this much is a grand achievement. The benefits and ramifications of the new system are sure to impact American society for decades to come. We are at peace, and our people are happy and well-treated, and the faith in the system is higher than it has been in decades. At his time as president comes to a close, President Johnson can now take some well-earned rest and reflect upon all that he has done. And re we remove a new dawn. Oh, look at that. We will get rid of that. Nice. And defeat is just a dying memory. Rumblings have changed. The clan rallies, as often they do. Through the streets of a southern town, the locals are amendable to them, furious as they are at being forced to live alongside blacks, and so they march confidently and proudly as they go. Suddenly, they find themselves faced with another crowd. A wash of all races have gathered to stand against the clan's marchers. Many have come in from out of town in an unprecedented level of organized resistance. Soon, violence breaks out between the two sides, and the clan are forced to retreat. A gaggle of union representatives sit across a fa uh, factory bus. Did I already read this one? Hmm. Yeah, I've already read this one, so... Silent No More. Yeah, this has already happened. I'm pretty sure, so. If you'd like to finish reading about this, please go right ahead. It's just... Okay. This is very odd. Um, yeah. That's very weird that we got that one again, so. Cool. Mm, let's see. 70... Uh, actually, get, get those helicopters. That's fine with me. And after night vision, we will do this one. Elite Forces. And we don't even get one political power a day. God, I don't like these high taxes, man. I really don't like them. Alright, intelligence analysis. And actually, we can suppress the left. And I, in the future campaigns, when I play as a Republican or a Democrat, I'll probably, or maybe not Democrat, but at least Republican, I will try not to suppress the center too much. Too much. Cool. A great society when LBJ, LBJ entered the White House in 1964. He entered that office with a promise on his lips. Before America's families and its workers, with God as his witness, and a full side of a skeptical world, the president had promised a society where no child would go unfed, no youngster would go unschooled. He had promised an end to racial discrimination, a health care system which would provide for America's sick, and an environment for children to enjoy. For this agenda, President Johnson has been criticized fiercely from every quarter by those who would be the enemies of change. Yep, yeah. he pushed on regardless, and however lonely that chair in the Oval Office can get. President Johnson can say he's made this great society a reality. In the wake of the achievement of our promises, the RDs have shown rare signs of improved cohesion, yet this pr might prove fleeting. Implementing Johnson's agenda's alienated millions of former RD voters who are being wooed by the demographics of the NPP and their unceasing attacks on our policies. Our own party's unity has been greatly strained by the Johnson agenda, making winning re-election a real challenge. Yet by God, the things we have achieved. We've given the American people hope, more so than they have dared to show in decades. And what, come what may, that is worth a lot. A great society for this country, the greatest country in the world. The national movement will shift in favor of the NPP. The Republicans and Democratic Party grows a little more unified and look a little better. Not bad. They're constantly bickering. Nice. So we finished that part of the tree. I really do want to test out, and with that, you know, acquire more senators outside our block if they can actually vote for us. We might still be able to do that one, but an unsavory bargain. If they can be trusted, they can handle this war. Securing interest, let's do that one. America runs a race against an oil market on the brink of free fall if it falls, and so too will its economy. In these precious, precarious circumstances, mistakes made of haste are more easily forgiven if they ultimately preserve the country's fortunes. Washington is sure to make plenty of mistakes by intervening overtly in the Arabian Peninsula. To say nothing of the political capital needs to convince Congress and the people in favor of another foreign 
uh, adventure. Rest easy knowing that the sacrifices we make now will pay off for millions of Americans' lives decades into the future. Prosperity, after all, makes forgiveness an easy choice. Nice. Very, very nice. Cool. So we do have a lot of money. I already cut construction, so I do want to see who we can elect for the next election, which is not going to go very well for us. So, But yeah, I definitely need to try it off screen. Oh, here, we'll do that one too. So yeah, political power is just not the issue. Like, if you know how to budget your political power, obviously I didn't budget that well, especially with the whole Battle for Italy thing. But like, even then, like we generally had enough to do whatever we needed, so... And since we're here, a moment to reflect. Let's go and do this stuff as well. Might as well, right? Hey, might as well take a moment to reflect. 3% more stability. We got everything's very strong. We still be we're able to do it, so. Got more political power as well. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So it is possible to get all the stuff down here. Yeah, I really need to try it. Hmm. Securing our interests. Very good. And then... If you have to think, gifts for the king. King Faisal holds sway over the nation state's embryo. We may have government, culture, and recognition and rule of law, but without guns to back its monopoly and violence, his dynasty may as well be one more tribe among the Arabian Peninsula's lawless Beodins. More specifically, Beodins vulnerable to the nationalistic overtures of a united Arab identity. Here in America, we can leverage its economic largesse to buttress the young nation's precarious situation. A shipment of guns, both outdated and state-of-the-art, will assure the king of the state uh, state's lastingness in the face of a subcontinent's worth of foes. Nice. I might as well read the next one, too. Smoke of the Wind. Uh, oh, if you wonder about that one, please go ahead. I mean, I'm not going to read any of these special events just because these happens pretty much every game, so. The Overture begins. Good. A Great Society. Oh, look at this. Oh, photogenic. So, a Great Society manifests itself. In the villages of Appalachia, life is as calm and rural as it ever was, but the last vestiges of crushing poverty are slowly but surely evaporating into nothingness. Dysentery, hookworms, goitres, all these symptoms of a life at the bottom fade away, and nothing but the romanticized notion of a country lifestyle remains. A great society manifests itself in the halls of the Mercy Hospital. Those without means are finally able to receive what they need the most, prophylaxis and treatments. A great society manifests itself in the streets of Harlem. Local residents, policemen, commuters, and many more people rush through the streets of the borough eager to go about their day. The next generation dreams of the future, dreaming of a world where someone like them enters the Oval Office, an idea where an absurdity a mere decade ago, and now almost seems like an inevitability. A great society manifests itself. In the schools of Chicago, children of all ages and races play together, learn together, and grow together. Teachers, pens, and book bags are taken for granted, and the time of need are almost entirely forgotten. A great society manifests itself. In the wilderness of Alaska, wild geese fly below the clear and starry sky. The vast landscape is near in touch. Not a single piece of human refuse lies anywhere. A great society required a great investment. Taxes were expanded. Businesses went insolvent. And a great deal of citizens opposed the project with everything they had, fearing the massive scope of Johnson's daring plan. But when President LBJ looks out the window of the Oval Office and sees what changed over the past few years, he is perfectly content with his achievements. Many doubted him when he announced his candidacy, claiming that he was a dreamer with unfeasible ideas who would fall apart once confronted with reality. These voices went silent and only history books remain. A great success. Photogenic, 2 p.m. Uh, let's see, yes. Uh, Barry and Lyndon sat together at a table enjoying the meal of the day and just chatting about whatever came to their mind. It was marked as a political meeting in their calendars, an opportunity to push their agendas through backroom deals, but both of them knew that this wasn't the real reason for their bi-weekly meetings. Even the greatest politicians need to slack off of their fellow colleagues once in a while. And I completely agree with you on this point, Lyndon. The pizza served here is laughably bad, anyways. Can we reschedule our next meeting? I booked a holiday trip in Arizona, so I'll be away for the week. You're taking a vacation, Barry? That's the first time I've seen you take a vacation in years. Jeez, what happened? I always thought that you were too uptight to ever take your mind off work a few, for a few days. Oh, I'm just doing a little photography tour through Phoenix. The city is just marvelous at this time of year. Seeing St. Mary's Basilica at night leaves an impression that will stick with you for years. <clears throat> Sounds fantastic. I didn't know that you went back to photography. Didn't you abandon the hobby a few years ago? Back then, I felt like I ran out of motives for my photos, you know. Every major city was suffocating under this impenetrably thick and gray blanket of smog. The phoenix from my childhood memories, the bright and vibrant gem of the sub belt, simply didn't match up with what my pictures showed, so I quit under the belief that I was just not skilled enough to reveal the true beauty of the place. That's what I thought anyways. However, the past few years have been nothing short of a miracle. The air is slowly clearing, the once barren ponds are gradually getting repopulated, and I believe that I even heard a songbird the other day, and for the first time in a decade at least. These business bigwigs and northern MPP varieties might fight your environmental plan with everything they've got. Well, let me tell you, the results have been astonishing so far. A lot of your policies are nonsensical, but what you've done to the nature of our beautiful nation is something great that 
shall never be forgotten. Have fun, Barry. Grow a little more unified. Environmentalist movement will appreciate this. Democrat wing of a party will grow more prominent. And the pro-business faction of the MPP will grow stronger. King Faisal, I'm C CIA. The fruits of human intelligence compound with every year they operate within a country's borders. In turn, a well-established intelligence apparatus with for forewarns precludes enemy action, sometimes without their knowledge. Which is why the CIA is so eager to expand their operations in the Middle East as of late. Our stiletto in the night needs ample pre preparation time to conduct their covert deeds, and we can satisfy their demands by sending them into the region before our armed forces. The company will wreak their infamous havoc where we need it most soon enough. Cool, I just let time go on, because time doesn't really matter too much anymore, for technology at least. Really doesn't matter too much. Uh, protect American interests. I mean, I guess we can if we really want to. Cool. Very, very cool. And we do have a cup of coffee here to keep us nice and warm. Alright. Um, I guess we could still vote for R&Ds. Why not? Presidential elections has begun to be elected about that. Please go right on ahead. It's a long way to November. And I wonder who's going to become president. I really do wonder. I don't think it's going to be one of us. But you never know. Oh, we need a campaign too. Oh, yeah. Um... Actually, look at New England. That's not bad. New England is not too bad, actually. Let's go do Great Plains. Why not? Great Plains it is. And gifts for the king. And King Faisal, I'm CIA. You know, I guess we could be doing that stuff. Ah, what is going on in Arabia right now? Are they having problems? Issues? They have an oil crisis. You know what? Mm, I don't think we'll be able to get down here by the end of this uh, episode. So... That's 49 days? 49 days? Goes a little bit more unified. Ooh, we could risk it. The 1964 uh, military police policy outlook. With the dawn of the new year, as we enter the second half of this decade, it's important that we continue to assess our military capabilities. Much of our military will still have sell huge to old doctrines based on old technologies. We have all the technological and manufacturing capacity that a superpower could ever ask for, so such old ways need a change. We could start, or should start, by commissioning a new report on potential areas of improvement. In a world of new conflicts, sticking to older ideas is a fool's errand. Eh, we can keep spending money, why not? That's fine with us, it doesn't really matter too much. Increase, well, a terrible, of course. Of course. Of course. Far right senators are probably going to keep their seats, which is fine. North America. Strengthen pro American sentiment would be nice, but that's alright. Alright, not bad. And then we'll do ARPA funding. The advert and widespread adoption of electronic computers has presented the Department of Defense with a unique opportunity. Computers represent the future of research, both military and civil, and investing in them for the ARPA Advanced Research Projects Agency will offer great leaps into scientific knowledge. As the U.S. has seemingly fallen behind its opponents, and evidenced by the German moon landing, more advanced tools, research tools will allow America to catch up. With this computing power, ARPA will have the ability to make once laborious calculations in mere minutes, allowing for much reduced R&D time. Um, if you want to read about this, this is about the... Uh, in, Saudi Arabia, please go right ahead, so. Please meet you. Hope you've guessed my name. Alright, let's go and campaign some more. Probably close that out as well. And, uh, New England or the Rockies. Let's do the Rockies. Cool. Not bad. Great society, there's nothing else here. 2.25 million, not bad. Civilian spending. I guess we really don't need any more political power every single day. So I guess at this point we could actually probably slash spending because civilian spending is so bad right now. Oh my goodness. <clears throat> but that was one of the things I did want to talk about in this episode. So I know that the, as you can tell, that the devs like force you to do or respond to the oil crisis. I understand why they do it, and you should you have to respond to it. Like it, like it does make sense that you wouldn't. But do presidents only focus on one thing for a given month at a time? You know, that that doesn't make sense to me. I think I'm, I'm just kind of like, I thought about this after I made the last video. Would it be better if it had its own GUI? You know, like graphics user interface for addressing the oil concerns and or having a set of decisions that'll mitigate like the effects of the oil crisis just because no matter who's president, they're always focusing on stuff more than just like God dang it, RDs. But just more than just one thing, excuse me, at a time. It doesn't make sense why they would, uh, uh, you know, just focus on literally one thing. So, I don't know. I, I think that having the oil crisis as a decision and or GUI would just be better. A specific, unique mechanic. Because, you know, it's going to get expanded someday, so. Especially if TNO2 ever comes out. So. But ARPA funny. 
It is already May 3rd. Wow. That is... That's nuts. Uh, let's do Great Plains again. Because we didn't do great that other time. But yeah, that, those are just my thoughts. Like, just... I don't know. Just... If we did... If we did have to do... <clears throat> the oil crisis. We could have literally gotten all things done fair and square down here. We literally could have done all that. But... It, it just didn't go that way, so... And for a kill, I think we're still in worse part. Mount infantry, not bad, not bad. All right, 72. Can get some better artillery, probably. Man, there's so much research here that we just don't do. 10 days left, and then, you know what, we can read about... I want to go down here, uh, let's see. I just want to see if we can get increase OFN unity. That's why I want to two C's concept. Department of the Navy. <clears throat> the current U.S. Navy. This is a heavy emphasis on using aircraft carriers as a tool for both power projection and easy aircraft transport. This is important during the Pacific War. And it still is, but it cannot be the sum total of our focus. New research and funding needs to be put into submarine programs to counter our enemies beneath the waves. We should also focus on expanding our nuclear triad in a variety of ways so that we will not be reliant on silos and bombers to dominate the newest form of warfare in total. It's vital that the U.S. Navy becomes a truly modern, relevant force. Let's go with the liberal option. Cool. And it's auto-saving, fine, whatever. Uh, what do we have here? Man, the RDs really just want to lose, don't they? Judicial shake-up, it is what it is. I guess it's, we... I think, actually, off-screen, to get to... After we uh, use const commands, I did with, go with a conservative option. Just to not piss people off, but I guess... Whatever. Hey, we can improve RD unity. Why not? Actually. I'll go do that. Strength and pro-American sentiment. That's fine. And then we'll probably... Uh, you can do that too. It doesn't really matter. Political landscape. Constantly bickering. They're willing to put aside their differences for now. So we didn't shatter the party yet. Nope, not yet. Not here. Great Plains. New England. Something like that. Great Lakes. Rockies. Eh, do that one. And we'll maybe do some New England as well. That'll be good. The upper budget. <clears throat> Which will eventually enable us to completely revamp the way we conduct warfare. Advanced processors would be coupled with yet undeveloped transistors would inevitably permeate all areas of science. And the potential in regards to performing a large sum of calculations in a short time frame will be of utmost importance in a wide area of scientific and military applications, Mr. President. <clears throat> Uh, or, or including President LBJ calmly listened to the monologue by the sweaty engineer in front of him. It was clearly clear that he was obviously prepared for this moment for weeks, and yet LBJ didn't understand a single word of it. He had a vague notion of the nature of the newly established ARPA and knew that this person was a leading engineer from it, but his difficulties in transmitting his assumingly or assumedly vast knowledge were apparent. All the president knew was that the ARPA representative attempted to convince a president to properly fund his department, which was supposedly set to fundamentally transform a wide range of subjects within just a few decades. However, People like the aforementioned engineer plead for more funding all the time. All of them make big promises about their pet projects will utterly revolutionize the world as we know it, and yet the vast majority of them produce rather unremarkable results. Uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson contemplated for a while the whole ARPA thing would really be as significant as the man in front of him claimed it would be, and claim eventually came to a conclusion. He's obviously exaggerating. A minor budget shall suffice. Maybe as a point, he can get some funding, but not too much. Sounds important enough. Let's provide his department with all the funding he needs. 4% of GDP? Well, we already have such a massive deficit, doesn't really, didn't really matter to me. Nice. <clears throat> oh, let's see. Oh, I can suppress the center. I should do that. I can hear people just clacking, clacking. Just typing away in uh, <laughs> the comment section. But the progressive primaries, if you like to read about that, please go right ahead. Uh, Jim Perca Kirkpatrick. Um, I think Scoop Jackson would make more sense for us. Ooh. Well, I mean, this is the MPP anyways, so... Um, that's coalescing into the far right. Yeah, I mean, it just makes more sense for probably Henry Jackson, probably. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want Gene Kirkpatrick. I mean, we're focused so much more on America for this one, so... I just At least my mind makes more sense. But we will do two seas concept. <clears throat> the U.S. Navy faces two vastly different opponents on either side. On one side, they face a formidable Imperial Japanese Navy with a heavy focus on carriers and air power. On the other, they face a Kriegsmarine with its vast fleets of battleships, cruisers, and subs. By nature, these two enemies are difficult to counter with a single overriding doctrine. Con consequently, it becomes necessary to split the USN into two different groups, the Pacific Fleet to counter the Empire and the Atlantic Fleet to counter the Reich. What's the point of even campaigning if RDs just keep sucking so hard? 
Let's see, the 1972 Republican and Democratic primaries. The primaries and caucuses are over. Now a thousand delegates from each state and territory of the Union are converging on the Miami Beach Convention Center in the eponymous city in Florida. As the RDs gathered, it's the end of an era as President LBJ, having already served the traditional due terms as president, is now stepping down. <coughs> With the top of the ticket now open, many have thrown their hats in the ring to make, take up the reins, however. The fight has boiled down to a two-horse race between Ford Motor Company Executive Robert McNamara and South Dakota uh, Senator George McGovern. McNamara, who seeks to bring business efficiency to governing, represents the more mainstream opinion of the RD Party as a moderate Democrat, while McGovern is a staunchly liberal Republican, whose unofficial slogan of acid, amnesty, abortion has become divisive across the nation, and it's posing a major question for the delegates at the convention. McGovern claims that he can take some of the votes of the MPP center wing, forging a new coalition that can expand America's progressive future, while McNamara's supporters are claiming that McGovern would destroy the RD Party and hand a victory to the National Progressive Party. However, questions both both options abound. Is McGovern too far left wing to hold the RDs together? Is McNamara business experience a boon or a hindrance? Many Republicans and Democrats are expressing dismay. Now, these are the only viable options they have this time, especially after the successful LBJ presidency, and raising concerns of a lack of support and fracturing of party unity, but the results of the final ballot are being announced, and the winner is... Uh, let's go with McGovern, because people actually really, really want me to get McGovern, so... With McGovern versus Jackson, this is... <laughs> this is weird. They're almost exactly the same, you know, compared to, like, McNamara and then Kirkpatrick, so... It's actually very high. That's actually pretty good. Anything else here gives us more unity? No, it doesn't look like it. Obviously, this one does, but it requires all three of these, and we won't be able to get down there, so which kind of sucks. Oh, we have technology to do as well. Not bad. It is August 2nd, so we'll see what happens. Uh, go ahead and grab that one. I don't want to be bothered with that stuff anymore. And we can campaign in the Great Plains, which is going to result in us not doing very well, apparently. Nice. TC's concept. Thank you very much. Cool. Yeah, party is... Oh, we can still improve. 10 to 15%. I don't think I've ever gotten to 5 to... Oh, maybe I've gotten to 5 to 10% before, but less than 5% before? I don't think I've ever gotten down here. That's actually really good, though. Uh, anything else here? No, no, no. I guess strengthen pro-American sentiment. Why not? Why not? Cool. And I think we'll have at least one more focus before we will end up with this. Let's set up shipments. Uh, Operation Sandstorm. Fighting their leaders. Oh, polls are updated. Don't really care. Oh, Operation Sandstorm. Why not? As of late, the Joint Chiefs of Staff busy themselves with preparing America's most comprehensive expeditionary force since Indonesia. Drawing from the lessons learned in the past decades, two largest wars, the country's finest generals and admirals drew minute, extensive plans for a lightning war involving all four branches of the U.S. Armed Forces. <clears throat> they described the immense firepower of America's tanks, guns, ships, and planes combined will, dem will demonstrate as a shock in all campaigns spanning the Middle East, and routinely inspect for any flaws that might lead to another quagmire. All told, the Pentagon assured America that Sandstorm will promise that, a storm. Woe bet betide the foes, or fools, fools who bar its path. Very nice. And I do apologize for my mispronunciations in this episode. My, mis my pronunciations have not been very good, but the Wyoming class battleship? Why not? Hmm... Oh, New England is looking not terrible. New England, the Great Plains, and the Rockies. Can we not screw this up, guys, please? Come on, come on, RDs. Hopefully we can get to totally unified, but I doubt it. AOS, very good. And Godfather releases. If you like to read about that, please go right ahead. Cool. Ave Maria, gratia plena. Hey! There we go. If you like to read about decrease of poverty, please go right ahead as well. Nice. Cool. The election will be done soon. And after that, we will probably do another focus. We'll just keep doing this stuff. Finding their leaders. Pan-Arabism is a mass movement with its corresponding strengths, weaknesses, and weaknesses disguised as strengths. In particular, the ideology has mobilized millions throughout the Middle East around several charismatic ideologues like Arafat and Al-Sadat. If the presence of such men inflamed the people's passions, then would not their sudden, abrupt absence snuff these passions out? The U.S. government has always been a staunch advocate of evidence-based policy. As its foremost experts in unconventional policymaking, Langley has been tasked to make conclusive results out of pan-Arabism's Arabism's greatest progeny. Very cool. And we can campaign, 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 campaign. campaign. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, let's see what happens, and let's keep going with this. Political landscape. Willing to put aside the differences. Ooh. Nice. There you go. Not bad. Not too bad. 
27 billion is obviously not very good. The major silent majority speaks. Oh boy. We could have hardly expected our deployment of ground combat troops to Saudi Arabia to remain covert for long, and since it's gone public, we've been inundated with opposition to our escalation of American presence in the Middle East. Students and South African veterans have staged anti-war demonstrations in several universities and parks across America, and then made public their plans to march on Washington to call for a halt in deployment. Senators from both sides of the party divide are being buried in angry letters from constituents, and many of them who have family who died in Africa, and consequently are urging calling in Congress for a freeze in troop deployments or for the more radical senators a total withdrawal. We'd lose serious fits in, in the international community if we just pulled out and we can't abandon the Saudis, slimy dudes though they may be, without jeopardizing our oil supply. All we can do is hope tensions don't keep escalating we are stuck, and we get stuck in a war we can't win. Gosh darn it all, why does such an oil-rich region have to be so unstable? The last thing we need is to get caught in another quagmire. Oh, oh boy. So, we had, what, 42 Republican senators, and now we have 43. We got one more. There's only one Democrat, and there's one person in the center, and McGovern won. Wow. <laughs> wow, okay. Not bad. Uh, that's, wow. That's not bad. That is really not too bad. All right, so, it was McGovern versus Jackson. I guess, you know... We went with the center, which had literally no support, because we were suppressing them, and we weren't really helping them out at all, but... Well, the center, you know, people don't like the Republicans in this campaign. But God, no one likes the center. <laughs> no one likes the center at all. And we have one Democrat and one center, and 43 Republicans, and... Jesus. Just... Oh my goodness. We actually gained a Republican. That is nuts. I thought we would just lose everything. Actually, we're willing to put aside the differences for now. Even the MPP is the same thing. They're willing to put aside their differences for now as well. But, uh, Black Gold Rush? What a measurable benefit of direct cooperation with Saudi Arabia. It's direct access to the pipelines, bursting full with oil. Their generosity has thus far been ably st stemmed the bleeding on America's economy since the oil crisis began with war on their doorstep and the U.S. Army their most stalwart shield against it. The Saudis believe dedicating some of the most valuable pumps solely for our Army's consumption. After the extracts leave the refineries, of course, will service both themselves and us in the short, medium, and long term. Really? Who are we to disagree? Nice. Awesome. Even though we ran a terrible campaign, as long as you run someone that the, other, the opposition or the people don't really like, then it's okay. Then it's totally okay. We're not really building up that much, but then, then again, we can't really build much here at all. Not bad. Strength of pro-American sentiment. And you know what? The Democrats didn't split from us. They did not split. See? If you suppress the center, you can still get Republicans to win. Or Democrats. But probably at least Republicans for now. But we're going to go through the government presidency just for a little bit. And then uh, I might go ahead and off-screen see if we can actually win and pass reforms using LBJ from where we started and had only 30 Republican senators, just to see if it's possible. Just to see if it's completely possible. Man, I can't believe we actually got another Republican. They really... They like the far, the far right here. Didn't do too bad, but not as good as I thought they would. Pick your targets. Um, yeah, uh, in for the kill. What America needs the least in the middle of its greatest economic crisis since the Great Depression is a protracted conflict sucking its money and attention. South Africa and Indonesia played merry heck on both, and that was just with a healthy economy, from the White House to janitor. America's government had wholeheartedly resolved to prevent Saudi Arabia from spiraling into a worse repeat of the last two wars that had wasted its energies and fortunes. To this end, the President requested that the Pentagon draw a timetable for military operations in the Middle East, immediately followed by withdrawal plans upon the war's conclusion, if Washington has its way. Then American soldiers will not spend any more time in the sandbox and they absolutely must. Well, which we probably won't even be able to get that one done. That's alright. Doesn't really matter to me. Not bad, though. Not bad. I'd like to unite the RDs a little bit more, though. But we'll see. Because we're about to have a new president, my friends. Which I've actually played as President McGovern before. So, friends... Friends, 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 today is a momentous day in American history. Two centuries ago, our nation's birth was a milestone in the long quest for freedom. But the beautiful, bold dream that our forefathers taught has for has yet to reach its con consummation. Today, rather than set forth a new dream, I urge I wish to urge the old dream on, that dream that I, too, have cried out for all my political career. I cry for more than simple freedom to act, to speak, and to be happy. I cry for freedom from the conflict that we embroil ourselves in time and time again for the majority of our great country's history. We have been in conflict with the nations both foreign and civil. Well, I say no longer shall we fight. No longer shall we enslave ourselves to the sword. Going forward, our swords shall be hammered back into our plowshares. America. 
I ask you to look deep inside your heart and truly realize the spiritual and emotional revolution this country is about to embark upon. No more saber rattling with foreign powers. No more annual threats of annihilation. No, America, I say unto you that part of history is unfinished. It's finished. Now comes the time for peace and reconciliation with those whom we've wronged and those whom have wronged us. I have been given a great responsibility to shepherd a great nation into such an era, and is not one that I accept lightly, nor is it a burden I can carry alone. It is my belief that this administration should incorporate the wisest and most peaceful, peaceable of individuals, as well as those most modest, that such an understanding between all may be achieved. I promise this America and more hail to the chief. Awesome. And I was correct in, in assuming that we would not be able to get that focus done. The McGovern presidency. The new face of the RDs is none other than one George Stanley McGovern of South Dakota, running on a platform of military de-escalation and divesting funds from the military to more civilian initiatives. President McGovern represents a significant departure from the policies of the 60s. Rather than continue to push America's position as a global military power, he will instead work to build up our country as a bastion of peace, prosperity, and diplomacy that will work to solve the world's problems with words rather than weapons. McGovern will need to first secure the support necessary to roll back the military adventurism of the last 10 years. A tough sell in the country so dedicated to being the world's last bastion of democracy, but a cell he is more than determined to close. <clears throat> Once the hawks have been reined in and their budget reduced, McGovern will use the funds to shore up the failures of American society and the hopes of maintaining the country's high standards of living and beating back the rhetoric of any extremists who would seek to undo us. Many question if a diplomatic approach is viable or even moral in a world filled with the enemies of democracy. The MPP in particular have already decried the potential of friendly overtures to Japan, but for President McGovern, there is no other possible path. Every day we continue down the road to warfare is one more tick for the doomsday clock. Every dollar spent on more bullets is a dollar not spent on helping good, honest Americans. It is time to rethink our priorities and begin a new legacy for the good of all mankind. Which is weird because we already, we literally finished all through President LBJ's uh, reforms, so... I mean, sure, poverty hasn't been eliminated yet, but still. We currently have 44 votes, so these are probably working for us. Maybe? Um, we've also secured, we still have the 8 votes outside our voting block. Nice! So, we can still pass whatever we need to pass, hopefully. McGovern Presidency. The hills of Arlington? The power to destroy the world is the only guarantee of peace, Mr. President. Eternal vigilance is the price we pay for the way for our lives. The words of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff weighed heavily on President George McGovern and Vice President Bob Dole, pressing them deeper into the limousine seats. The briefing on the nuclear arsenal ripped away any learning exuberance from the inauguration, leaving the two speechless from the terrifying power vested in them. McGovern uttered four words to the driver, take us to Arlington. As the two walked up a hill overlooking the rows of white headstones, McGovern turned to Dull, all this talk about how nuclear weapons ensure peace, and I can't stop thinking about the men who still never came home. Dull sighed. A lot of people still say defending South Africa was right, George, that we can't win the Cold War on defense. I won't throw a fight that the Germans or Japanese start, McGovern countered as they crest the hill, but if winning the Cold War means digging across the new, digging acres of new graves here, and if they still think you're wrong, Look at Germany, McGovern said darkly. Two decades of war left them, a society rotting from the inside out. We can't do that to America. War will end us before it ends our enemies. There's no time for celebration. Inauguration and general fanfare aside, President McGovern does not have the luxury of resting on his laurels and basking in his victory. In every presidency, it is said that the first hundred days are the most crucial, setting the agenda and determining the success of the rest of the term. Thus, there is not a moment to lose. It is time to push forward with the most pressing legislative priorities to lay the groundwork for the coming four years. President McGovern intends to give a speech before Congress, detailing his plans for the country in a far more formal manner than his promises on the campaign trail. Once both the party and the opposition have a clear idea of what our aims are, we can begin taking the necessary steps to pass legislation and get this presidency off to a promising start. Awesome. The poor. Ours may be the greatest nation on earth, but how can we claim the high moral ground and spreading liberty and prosperity abroad we cannot do so at home? While America spends billions on new military technology and funding foreign insurgencies, many of our own people are struggling to make ends meet. The economic disruption of the oil crisis only furthered the woes of our most impoverished citizens. There's never been a more crucial time in Earth's country's history to put the poorest first. There's so many better places America's money could be going than to yet more bullets and ordinance. President McGovern will speak clearly on what he means to do to help those among us who need it. Oh, among us. More support for welfare programs, stimulus packages for deprived communities, increased funding for infrastructure and de development that will provide blue-collar jobs, all this and more must be considered if we're to ensure America stays a land of opportunity for all. From source of plowshares. The House chamber was filled to the brim as President McGovern strode to the podium. There were scattered cheers and applause. Many of the students in attendance had volunteered for McGovern's election campaign. My fellow Americans. McGovern smiled. It came easily in comfortable territory, surrounded by supporters that would play well to the other audience, sitting in their living rooms across America. A country's strength is measured by more than the soldiers and nuclear weapons. For every soldier deployed abroad, there are 10 Americans workers, farmers, young and old, black and white, who support them, and they will be called upon to replace the men who never came home. 
McGovern gripped the sides of the podium as he hit his stride. We cannot neglect America's responsibility as the last light of liberty in this world, but Americans have a right to ask, do we neglect our nation at home, its communities, and its peoples by fighting wars of choice abroad, or even as the oil crisis and continues? Would we not be better served by turning away swords to plowshares to welcome our weary soldiers home from endless war, to, in, to entrust a fair, prosperous America to our children? Scattered applause rose from the audience as McGovern pressed his point home. America has decided that it has had enough of sacrificing liberty in the name of security, of foreign entanglements without end, a prosperous and just America is a better guarantee for the free world than a garrison state. Our work begins today, in which we do a new food for peace. The Ba'athist insurrections and ensuing oil crisis brought chaos to the Middle East. Amidst the carnage, ordinary life amongst the people there has broken down, and supplies of food, water, and medicine has become scarce in areas affected by the fighting. When people are desperate, terrible things can happen if the region continues down its current path of instability. For the conflict is certain. Conflict that could ultimately pull in America and other powers that have devastated con devastating consequences for the world. Now is the time for America to take the initiative in the world affairs, not through more warfare, but instead by promoting peace in the 50s. President Eisenhower created the Office of Food for Peace, an organization dedicated to exporting agricultural products to struggling nations around the world. The last few administrations have let it fall to this wayside, however. Now President McGovern sees great promises in this forgotten initiative and has vowed to completely revitalize it as a tool for helping the struggling lands of the Middle East. Food is strength, and food is peace, and food is freedom. Food is a helping hand to people around the world whose goodwill and friendship we want. No more will we solve every problem with guns and bullets. Instead, we'll work to fill the bellies of the world. The Republicans become less popular, and the Democrats look a little better as well. The Southern of South Dakota, after we get some technology. It is 19, of course, 73. Now much had changed in the fields of Toddville, Iowa. Presidents came and went into faraway Washington, but the few legislators ever came to visit. Those who did had all said the same thing, that things would be better, that life would change, and it never really had, even as children moved away or joined the army, never to return. The blank. Few had ex any expectations that President McGovern would be any different, sure. He was from South Dakota, son of the Great Plains, like themselves, but that was it. And the residents of Toddville were sure that they'd hear the same hackneyed platitudes and calls to sacrifice that inevitably fell on the communities of rural America. What does it mean to be an American in the Midwest today? The President's voice carried through the sporadic stage, sp sporadic static. Our communities and families in the plains are asked to give their sons and crops to serve America, and what have they received in return? A visit or two by Washington politicians every two years, even as funds and jobs drop favor, dry up in favor of the coasts? The listening residents are not quietly, at least someone knew how they felt. The people of my home state and across the plain in the southwest are hardly are hardy, God-fearing, patriotic people. They deserve the same dignity as any other American. And under my administration, they will not be ignored. Fly over country no longer. Cool. And the armed. Regardless of one's thoughts of war, it cannot be denied that those who fight them have historically been given the short end of the sick. Millions of men have been sent overseas, figuratively thrown at our enemies in the hopes of holding them back with their bodies. Many of those men did not return home. Many came back with a few limbs short or with broken spirits. What in the end was their reward? A medal, a handshake, a kick out at the back door, and short. Active soldiers are expected to serve without complaint, while wounded veterans are sent home and forgotten about. President McGovern wishes to outline his plans to support the troops, even as he prepares to scale back the military. Better standards for active duty soldiers, support and compensation for wounded veterans, and a much-needed update to the rules of engagement are all on the watch table. Not only will this help appease the hawks who view our plans as an affront to the military, it will also help ease our plans in beginning scaling back the military altogether in the name of human dignity and the betterment of our people. Begin with withdrawals. The USA Freedom Act, uniting and strengthening America by funding, restoring energy and economic development over militarism act. My God, that's a long name. That's President McGovern's flagship policy. The act proposes the first reduction of the U.S. military budget in decades, a proposition that has understandably incensed the more hawkish residents of Capitol Hill. Development will be wound down. Recruitment numbers will be reduced. A significant amount of American troops stationed abroad in partner nations will be called back home and demobilized. The purpose of all of this, the money saved by slashing the military budget will instead be diverted to the civilian budget. Initiatives for aiding the poor will be bumped up. Much needed infrastructural development will be brought forward. Education, housing, healthcare, and other crucial areas will be see a windfall unlike anything they've seen in a generation. No longer will we throw all of our money killing people instead. We'll invest in the well-being and future of the nation. Passing this act will be crucial for President McGovern to begin the process of leading America to a brighter future. Fa failure could undermine the entire mandate of his presidency. It is time to pull out all the stops to prove that peace really does stand a chance in this world. Now, so we do have quite a bit of PP. Putting our differences aside, we still have those extra eight votes. So, oh, but okay, none of the far right senators want to support us. Okay, so we're not going to get this done. The senator, the Democrat senator, opposes our bill. Oh, oppose. There seems to be plenty of room for compromises. They oppose, so we won't be able to get this done unless we cheat, which we might be able to cheat. So, uh, let's go and get this one done too. There you go. Introducing the USA Freedom Act. 
Today, the McGovern administration's first piece of major legislation, the USA Freedom Act, enters debate on Capitol Hill. The bill, back, back acronym for the U.S. are united and strengthening America by funding restored energy and economic development over militarism act of 1973 is an omnibus bill that, broadly speaking, reprioritizes federal spending away from the military towards domestic projects necessary to revitalize the American economy in the wake of the oil crisis disruption. The bill has attracted no small share of detractors who call it a drastic and unprepared move towards American isolationism against the ever-present threat of Germany and Japan. The McGovern, Mc, the, huh, my apologies, I'm speaking too fast. The McGovern administration has remained unmoved by the criticism, with aides noting that the American people gave them a mandate to pursue a nation building at home instead of conflict abroad, and that Congress flirts with ignoring the will of the people at its peril. The Freedom Act is a momentous piece of legislation that carries significant implications for the future of American foreign and domestic policy, and its fate now lies in the hands of the congressmen assembled in Capitol Hill. Let's get the votes. Which I don't think we'll be able to do this since we can't even get any of these guys over here. Talk with the Republicans? I mean, you can try that. Talk with the Democrat? You might as well try that as well. Talk with the MPP Democratic Socialist? I mean, you might as well. We won't be able to do this, so we'll have to use constant commands for this. So we'll just get through the focuses first, and then we'll pass it, probably. We shall make our presence known. America's new path aims down the road to peace. That road will be a long and hard one. It will take the best efforts of the brightest diplomats this nation has to offer. It will be filled with challenges and peril, but whatever the hurdles we must be willing to face, them for the future of our country and all for mankind. The main hurdle of the road to peace is that it cannot be walked alone. When one looks across the sea, it seems an impossible road to walk. Japan, her belly bloated with the looted wealth of countless nations. Germany, her hands stained with the blood of so many innocents. How can we possibly find peace with these nations? Why would we want peace with these nations? In the name of peace, we must at least be willing to try. Even if they're not willing to listen, we must make our intent clear to our rivals. We're done endlessly clashing over petty ideology or territory. We are fed up with, to the ears up with old men dreaming up wars for young men to die in. And we, if we make it clear that we are willing to listen, then there might be even the slightest chance that we will be willing to talk. No more will we raise a sword, it's time to offer the olive branch. And if it fails, if you'd like to read about this, please go ahead, but we're going to see if we can actually pass it through unconventional means. Alright everyone, and the act actually passes with totally not using Kant's commands, but the result of the final vote and the Senate are in. And the McGovern administration has seen its first successful bill, safely through Congress and to the President's desk, despite the objections of the traditional foreign policy community and the military Congress has authorized the USA Freedom Act's budget, allocations effective from 1973 onward. The Pentagon's budget has been cut for the first time in over two decades, and federal administrators are launching assessments into a new batch of social programs to be funded with reallocated spending. More contin contentious will be the new negotiations between the U.S. and its allies in the OFN about defense and troop commitments. Although the USA Freedom Act calls upon the government administration to reduce troop deployments overseas, the measure is likely to meet significant pushback from OFN member nations, most notably Australia, sitting on the doorstep of the co-prosperity sphere. We'll deal with that as it comes to it. Cool, and we shall finish off with this. If you like to read about this, please go ahead again. And I want to see what the final event is for McGovern, even though, technically, I've already done it before. Also, for this campaign, I did use cost commands, like I said earlier, basically. Uh, but we did get 52 Republican senators, which is not too bad. Kind of surprising, but I do want to go back and see if we can actually play fairly with LBG before we end this campaign. All right, and the Oval Office rumbled with activity as a TV crews prepared for President McGovern's live address. President, Vice President Dole, Secretary of State Lodge, and President McGovern huddled behind the desk, hurriedly going over any loose ends. Is everyone at state and defense ready? McGovern asked quietly. Once it sends, we need to hit the ground running. Send peace feelers out to the Japanese and Germans, reassurances to the Canadians and Australians. Lodge nodded. All of our embassies are ready to go. On your word, Mr. President. The three read, through the familiar lines of the speech, thinking of other things. We can't be sure of how Germania and Tokyo will react, McGovern said, rubbing his eyes nervously. What happens if we're left stuck in the cold? Dahl leaned forward. You're right. We don't know if the Germans or Japanese will play ball, but the American people want a more peaceful world, and we owe it to them to try. If it doesn't work out, we can always make sure the Germans and the Japanese are kept busy with the Middle East while we focus on domestic policy, Lodge added. They need the oil. We have Texas. The film drew quiet for quiet, and the president looked into the cameras as the lights came on. Burning away the shadows in the Oval Office, we dare to dream of a better world, which does technically end the content for America. But let's go back and see if we can actually play fairly with LBJ and actually get those other bills and reforms passed. And here we are, my friends, back in May 14th, 1972. But if we look over here, now this has got to be a bug. This has got to be a bug in the game. But congressional situation, now I have done inquired votes in the Senate for the past seven months. But we now have 50 votes we have 32 Republican voters, as well as 18 votes from outside of our block for our next piece of legislation. So it is 100% possible to get this done and accomplished. So we have the right to life, which we ended before I started using commands in the last video. So then you can go ahead and do in the pursuit of happiness. 
and then you can do Great Society. So it is 100% possible. We did not need to use console commands to pass and do all of the Great Society focuses. I can prove it here right now on this channel, right now. And we're going to go to the conservative option to not piss people off for the elections. But it is 100% possible as LBJ with enough political power to get through the entire focus tree for the Great Society without using console commands. At least until they probably patch the little bug here. But that is extremely good to know just because we can and we still have those 18 voters which I'm sure this is a bug but I've proven it here that you can do a full LBJ run LBJ run with Alcon's commands completely in its entirety and also uh, let's see I, I don't really care about the elections right now for this campaign obviously but you can even do this one too you can get 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 everything done so very good to know and very good to prove but if you enjoyed this campaign please do leave a like Subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow in another video. Thanks for watching, have a great, great rest of your day.